What I'd like to do in the next uh, session is to try and uncover some of the magic under the carpet here that actually let Shruti show you that demo a few minutes ago. So I'm going to explain how we actually do compute networking and storage and try to map what you actually saw to the actual technology that we have here. So the core and most fundamental technology piece that we have here is a new nested hypervisor that we call HVX which we basically built from scratch to run as a high-performance hypervisor built specifically for the cloud and for the use cases that we've identified around being able to run any application on top of any cloud. And this HVX is coupling both a nested virtualization engine, which deals with compute, software-defined networking, which allows us to build any L2 network in any cloud together with a few L3 services and I'll go over those and the kind of things that we actually allow you to do and storage functionality which basically lets you not worry about how you actually access your disks in a public cloud when we can run on any cloud. We're completely uh, cloud agnostic. You can think of it that southbound will cloud agnostic and northbound you can basically run any VM on top of us. Kind of like a um, universal adapter in uh, some sense. So the first core technology is HVX, our nested hypervisor, which we designed to run on an already virtualized hardware. Now there are different technologies and different techniques to actually implement the hypervisor. Most hypervisors today rely on hardware features to do so. Uh, Intel VT, AMDs, uh, SVM, uh, instruction sets. The problem is that, that this kind of hardware support is not available in any way in any of the public clouds today. Another technique which was quite popular in the past it was power virtualization in where the actual guest VMs are aware to the fact that you're running on top of a hypervisor. That's what Zen basically did, as you guys know. Um, but as you saw, we want to run any VM which we don't want to do any changes, any conversions, not changing anything to it. So what we are actually doing is binary translation, similar in a way to the way that VM actually started in the late 90s. So what we're doing is binary translation with direct execution, meaning all user space code runs directly untranslated on the CPU, while privileged code goes translation, and we have a lot of optimizations in place in order for it to be able to run and perform well. And another key thing that we have to add, because what we just described basically solves the CPU and memory issues, but, as you all know, a virtual machine also requires network interface cards and storage devices. And the different hypervisors and different platforms expose different NIC types and disk types. So we're basically exposing um, what looks like a native VMware environment also in terms of hardware devices. Meaning you can use, as Shruti showed you, VMXNet3 or PVSCSI. If you're coming from the VMware world, VIRD.io, if you're coming from KVM, and of course all the usual emulated devices such as E1000, uh, LSI, uh, SAS, etc. So that's the, the core and most fundamental part which basically solves compute. But as Naveen mentioned, a real burning issue when actually taking a complicated application and taking it to the cloud is around networking. Because if you look at all the leading cloud providers today, you do not get real layer 2 access, meaning no VLANs, no broadcasting, no multicasting. You do not get full control over the number of NICs you have. In some senses, you have some flexibility. For example, inside an Amazon VPC, yeah, you can add multiple NICs. In some clouds, you cannot. And you're also, in many cases, limited to what protocols you can actually use in those cloud providers. So the fundamental networking problem that we have here, we solve it by basically building an overlay network, 
meaning that we expose a clean layer 2 network with a distributed switch that we've developed. It is done when you're running on a single host using our own mechanisms, when traffic is basically tunneled between different hosts running in the cloud, giving you complete abstraction, when the only requirement that we actually need in order to implement it is UDP connectivity. With that, all those nice features that you might rely on from your private data center are now available, including static IPs and VLANs, and you can do VXLAN, which might be uh, useful also in the, when you're running a VMware environment, we'll touch on that uh, a bit uh, later. And because, as I said, you can run now any VM and you can expose any network, you can take existing network appliances such as firewalls by, by checkpoints or Fortinet or those balancers by five routers by Cisco and just take them as is, don't change anything to them. They will retain their existing configuration because the underlying hardware will look exactly the same, same device type, same MAC addresses. You do not, do not need to change anything in the configuration, just run them as is. The last bit of fundamental technology that we have here is also storage overlay. And the way that it actually works is it's a layer with a few features. Most of them are for performance, which allow us to perform well in the cloud in terms of storage, allow us to take snapshotting very easily. We do that by utilizing a copy on write file system. Coupled with an abstraction between, as you guys might know, most cloud providers provide basically two different types of storage uh, elements. The first one is an object storage, such as Amazon's S3, which is not the usual type of storage uh, system that you would have on-premise. And the second one is um, a block device uh, service, such as Amazon's EBS or Google's uh, persistent drives. So we've added an abstraction layer, which is basically a file system that we've developed, which lets us store the images uh, that, as Shruti showed you, she just uploaded them with no conversion, which are actually being stored in, for performance and for global accessibility and for scalability on top of an object storage, as you see below, but expose a local block device to the VMs which are actually running on top of HVX. So for them, they're simply accessing a local disk. That coupled, by the way, with the networking abilities that I've mentioned earlier, means that you can also very easily run NFS, or SCSI servers in your network. And a few other cool features that we've added because we could, because we have a layer here in between, for example, it's very easy for us to expose a transparent RAID 0 because we basically have a layer which sits just beneath the VMs and your disks, meaning you can create huge disks go, going all the way up to, to 20, 25 terabytes for a single volume. And the reason that we can do that, although the different cloud providers are much more limited in the, in the size of the volumes that, that they offer, is because we have this abstraction layer. Also because we control the underlying hardware is that then we can also expose a virtual CD-ROM that you can just insert and eject an ISO that you've uploaded to our library. So for example, something which is quite unique, you can just install an operating system or a virtual appliance from scratch in the public cloud. So that's basically our, uh, our core technology. Um, if you have any questions about it, I would love to take those. Or if you'd like me to, for example, show you and try and map what the demo that Truity did to the primitives that I just uh, showed you, I think it can be an interesting idea. Your emulated uh, L2 interconnect, what do you do for multipoint traffic broadcasts or, or multicast? Is it fired unicast to each other node? or? So we have a, we have a few optimizations there. Um, in general, 
it's not very far from what, from what you just described, at least for multicasting. For broadcast, it works quite different. Um, in practice, what we saw is we haven't seen real performance issues because of that. Mm -hmm. And we have also quite a few ideas on how to add a few more optimizations, specifically for multicast, which is a bit more challenging because the way that... If you want to filter and yeah. do the right thing, exactly. it's hard, I would think. Yeah. Okay. Any other uh, <coughs> questions? So let's try and, and do a quick exercise, which will basically show you all the different primitives and what's actually going on here beneath. So let's assume for the simplicity that we're running on Amazon and everything that I'm saying right now is, is the same for every cloud provider. So the first thing that Shruti basically did was uploading four VMs, right? So what did she do? She basically pointed our import tool to her vSphere and uploaded the VMs, the VM decays themselves as is to the Ravello image library, which sits on top of S3 or Google Cloud Storage. So that was the first part, just taking the VM decays as is. On the process, by the way, we also, as Rudy mentioned, we extract metadata from vSphere, vCenter, we also pass the images in order to extract some more data that is not accessible through the vSphere vCenter APIs. For example, such as some more networking data or OS specific data, which can be used later on in order to ease the user's life on the canvas instead of him actually inputting all the different uh, fields. Then she created the application in Ravello. Once she hit public, what her management system basically did behind the scenes was to provision the relevant resources in the public cloud. Now, for the sake of this exercise, let's say that we've provisioned two instances on Amazon. Okay? And what we install on those is basically our own software, which is HVX. And beneath, if we want to, to get a full picture, we basically have Zen running on hardware, because this is EC2 AWS. Then we got to HVX. Then we basically configured this application. That's something that our management system does behind the scenes. What it actually did, it sent commands to all these HVXs to, first of all, bootstrap VMs on top of those. So we had four VMs in that application. These VMs data will be actually streamed with a copy and read from the image library to the HVX and exposed as disks to the VMs. It also created a tunnel between the different HVXs for the sake of networking. It also created some NAT rules so traffic will actually be able to flow inside to the VMs for the external services. Now every data that was written on any VM was actually written to a different file on the host because we're utilizing their copy and write file system. And this different file was eventually used for the blueprint that Shruti created, which was actually written back, just that small change back to the image library. So that's the whole picture from end to end of what we actually, actually did though. Any questions or should we go to the next session? You said you're importing the <coughs> The MDKs yeah. from vCenter, or can we have just have uh, VMDKs from like local disk, uh, VMware Workstation, or other VMware? Yeah, great question. So today we can either connect directly to the uh, to the vCenter API and just extract the VMs and upload them. You can also point to a VMDK file or to an OVF file. Uh, we also support some other formats like the, the KVM na native formats. Um, the first thing that we did in the system was to make sure that we are uh, compatible with vCenter and vSphere because these are usually the more uh, uh, common systems in the enterprise. We, in most cases, Workstation and Fusion VMs would work as is on Ravello, 
we're aware of some minor issues that we're uh, fixing right now. Yeah. Do you envisage, or is, would that be possible that you sell or, or license HVX to customers with a mixed environment for our private cloud internally? It's, a, it's an interesting question. Uh, we, <laughs> it, it, it does come up fairly often. There, there's several different uh, monetization opportunities here and business model opportunities here. Um, certainly, selling HVX as a standalone entity is one of them. It will enable you to run that in your private cloud or in the public cloud in your own VPC, for example. Uh, you could do that. Or we could package the entire Revelo management system as a software itself and, and sort of do that, sell that. Mm -hmm. We considered all of this and we decided that in the first phase of Revelo, we wanted to uh, offer a cloud service, which is why we're a cloud service provider. So that's really where we're focused right now. And it allows us from a business perspective to move very quickly because we don't have to worry so much about packaging and this and that. Guild's team deals with all the internal stuff, but what the customer sees is something that <clears throat> we think is quite pretty. But if we had to start packaging things, it would take longer and be a different business model altogether. The other reason we think is that uh, we kind of like the, the cloud business. You know, we all grew up in, in hardware uh, <laughs> and then did software infrastructure after that. This is like the next evolution. So we wanted to do it that way. Also because if you kind of look at why the cloud can, you know, Amazon's been around since 2008, uh, and they're significantly over four or five billion dollars in revenue. And the reason they're able to generate such high revenue out of it is because it's essentially reselling data center space, cooling, hardware, software, so all of that put together. So it's a good portion of the value chain. We think it's an interesting business model. So that's why we're here first, and we'll explore other opportunities uh, as we as we get there. Okay. So did you say? support OVF? Yeah. As well as OVA? I thought there was one. OVA, OVA. yeah. OVA is basically a, a tar file of an OVF with VMDKs. To, today you'll need to untar it, actually. It's something that yeah. we, we will add. It'd be nice just to get yeah. Yeah, we can <laughs> If it's possible, because yeah. it's a pain converting. No, it is. And, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an RFE. It's an RFE that's What's sitting that? in our JIRA for a while. We, <laughs> we need to get to it. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's probably just they have to unpack it for you. It's just who unpacks it? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. It's exactly OVAs right. are nice. Yeah, it's exactly right. I've got a question about. Uh, there's been some allusion to integration points and APIs and things like that. What sort of APIs are there? You know, I'm thinking a lot about private clouds, and people are starting to have private cloud stuff, especially the enterprises that you guys are are referencing yep. here. You know, rather than you guys being another sort of one-off thing that uh, a human has to go, well, yeah, you, so you do templates and stuff like that. That's cool, but, you know, a human's going to have to go in there and deploy these things when somebody requests it. Uh, can I tie this into my vRealize automation uh, front end already, my catalog, my service catalog through an orchestrator? Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so, yeah, so, so basically like that. everything that I showed and much more uh, that Trudy showed is available through a RESTful API. As a, almost, a, almost a religion, the way that our UI can use just the RESTful API. So everything that we do is exposed using our, our API. We also have a Python SDK, um, and there are some works on a PowerShell SDK, for example. <laughs> and we have quite, quite customers integrating from, from Java, from uh, Scala, Ruby, we had C++, Perl, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, ha but having something appear, appear next to my on-premises stuff, on-premises stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, let me stay on-premise here. The, uh, um, <laughs> having a, a catalog item appear next to the on-premises stuff to do this mm -hmm. would be pretty powerful, you know, like I don't even necessarily want my users to know that they're deploying into the oh. public cloud, you know, some of them, you know, some people mm -hmm. don't even know what an IP is, they, you know, it's just this thing they type in somewhere, oh. you know, and if it, they happen to get a 153 that doesn't look my, like my, my on yeah, my, site stuff or whatever, know. you know, they may, may not even notice, I'd just like to, you know, make it seamless and yep. it looks like yeah, yeah, that's a possibility. Yeah, man, man, for example, we had in the past some customers doing an integration with ServiceNow exactly for that uh, yep. purpose. Yeah. 
yeah. various uh, tools. Uh, yeah, I happen to be in the midst of vRealize automation, but yeah, ServiceNow, a lot of the workflow stuff, you know. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. cool. Is there a performance impact running on HVX? And if there is, is there then a cost impact running on Ravello in the cloud versus my hourly cost if I was to run natively on the cloud? That's a very good question. If Let's, uh, I'll, uh, let you're me draw a diagram right. and then you can uh, okay. explain the, the details specifically because it makes it a little easier to follow if I, if I outline a table here for you. Um, okay, so let's look at basically, this is uh, an x86 server, this is Zen, this whole thing underneath is Amazon, right? And the first scenario is you run a VM here, natively, on Amazon. Second scenario is you run it on Ravello. So it would look like this. This would be an x86 server. This would be Zen. And this would be, uh, sorry, this would be HVX. And this would be a VM here. So you're talking about this overhead, right? OK. So now let's look at, from a high level, let's look at uh, CPU performance, let's look at network performance, and let's look at I.O. performance. Okay, so if you think of this as a, as a grid, so these are the scenarios on top, these are the micro benchmarks, uh, let's say an aggregated view of micro benchmarks in that category. And we normalize this to 1, 1, 1. Okay, so this is, you're getting 100% performance here on, on, on this. So the question is, what do you get here with, uh, with, with, HVX. All right. So in, in, a, in a case where you have only one VM running on HVX, the CPU performance here will be in the 0.98 to 0.99%, uh, basically barely any overhead. Okay. And Gil will explain to you in a second why. Uh, networking can be anywhere between, uh, I'd say, 0.8 to about 2.2x better. So you have a little bit sort of, you know, maybe a slight hit if it's going out all the way. But if it's going between apps, and I'll get to why in a second, you answer. could actually see better performance from a networking perspective. And I.O., you could see about, you know, similarly about a 20% hit. So uh, let's go through this table first and cover some other scenarios later if there are any questions. Gil, right. you want to sure. talk about it? Yeah. So by the way, as always with, uh, with performance, it depends what, what's the workload. So also, let's assume that you're using power virtualized devices because you were probably using them on premise because that's a way you can actually get to decent performance. So, if we're talking about CPU, we're talking about user space code. It just runs directly on the CPU. We don't interfere in any way. It is exactly the same as if the guest was running on top of Amazon directly. And so you're the 99% uh, also. It's only the kernel code that's translated. So it's only the kernel code that gets translated, and also this translation gets heavily cached. So, so you don't have to do any sort of process or scheduling. You're just passing all that stuff straight to the other hyper, to Zen. To the underlying hyper. Underlying yeah. hypervisor. Yeah, it can be Zen. It can be KVM and Google, right. for example. Um, okay. Networking. So as I've been said, it depends if you actually are going out of the VM like to a, out of the instance in Amazon, basically, out of HVX to a different HVX through a tunnel, then there is some overhead because there is some processing, there is some header slapping and removal, similar to any other tunneling uh, or SDN uh, software, not very different uh, from that. Depending on your ben benchmark, are we talking about small packets, large packets, then the heat can actually get to around 20%. In the most common case, that you will run many VMs on top of a single HVX. And remember that we have this knowledge because you're working in an application scope. So we basically have knowledge on locality. So we can exploit that and make sure that we schedule the different VMs inside a single application to run on top of the same HVX. Meaning all network traffic that normally would have gone into the Amazon network is actually a loopback in that HVX's memory right now. So then you can actually see much better performance than what the actual Amazon pipe would limit you to. So that's why you can see up to 
2.2. Uh, we've we've seen more. more than that. Yeah. Uh, we we just did some, and we are in the process of publishing a paper on this specifically. Uh, it should be out in hopefully a couple of weeks, and uh, in that we'll describe these different scenarios. And uh, in, instead of just giving relative numbers, we'll actually give absolute numbers as well. Mm -hmm. For example, we've seen uh, close to, I think, 9 gigabits per second yeah. between two VMs running on the same HVX. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, as an example of something that's obviously under good conditions. We'll mm -hmm. give a whole spectrum there yeah. but just to, uh, to help you get a picture there. Yeah. And with I.O., again, it depends. Are we talking about random, sequential, uh, the size of the IOPS that we're actually doing? You will, you can see up to 20, maybe even 25% hit in some cases, but to remind you, these are synthetic benchmarks. So, all in all, usually for a mixed workload, when you're not actually at a 100% utilization of all the different subsystems, the hit is not uh, very significant. And the cost you end up paying hourly is, sounds like not that much different either. So, the pricing model is, is on demand. It's a bit different than that of Amazon or Google because we had to. We hope it's a simpler one. Uh, do you want to? Uh, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> we hope it's simpler. The, uh, <coughs> the, the so Amazon and and Google and pretty much any cloud has a concept of a virtual machine and they price a virtual machine. So it's really easy to see. If you have a small virtual machine, you pay two cents. If you've got a large virtual machine, you pay ten cents. Whatever. It's really easy to see that. In, in Ravello's case, we, we look at things from an application boundary perspective. An application could have uh, two VM, one VM, two VMs, 10 VMs, 200, like we talked about. So how do you sort of do that? So what we decided to do was we, we took the, all the resources in the application. So you add up all your CPU, add up all your memory and, uh, and your storage, and you divide that into certain building blocks, you know, like chunks. Uh, one chunk is a 2V CPU 4 gig chunk. Another one is a 2V CPU 8 gig chunk. So if it's more memory intensive, you'll probably use chunk number two. Uh, if it's less memory intensive, you'll use chunk number one. And it's based on how many chunks you use for your application. So that's the only difference. But otherwise, when you net it out, our model is designed to be very close to Amazon or Google for the simplest applications that don't require complex networking when you don't care about performance. It's designed to be very much uh, similar to Amazon. But as you start needing more performance, more complexity from a networking perspective, uh, then you, you move to uh, a, a little bit above that. And it really depends on where you land. So there's a pricing calculator online. We can go through a specific example if you want on that to give you kind of a range. But when Shruti went through it, you saw that four VM application mm -hmm. that had two vCPUs each, each VM at about four gigs of RAM, I think, mm -hmm. worked out about 41 cents from a cost-optimized perspective all the way up to 54 cents. And that was for a complex network scenario. So you could go even lower. I think about 30 cents or something like that is the, is the lowest price. So since my machines would now run, instead of on Zen for AWS, they would run on HVX, yep. mm -hmm. yeah. will other customers... VMs also be running on the same HVX? No, that's a very, very good question. We do what we call application boundary consolidation, if we consolidate. We sometimes don't even consolidate, but if we do, it's done at the application boundary, which means that we would right-size the host we get from Amazon. We have a, a cloud-fitting algorithm that I'll ask Gil to get into a little bit because it is kind of interesting. Um, so we look at the size of the virtual machines, we pick the right size hypervisor, and we try to squeeze that entire application into that hypervisor. Okay, But nobody else's VMs will run on that hypervisor. Nobody else's. It's only yours, only belonging to that application. In fact, if you have two applications, they will still not share the same hypervisor. They will always be on different ones, mm -hmm. even your own. So there is a strict app boundary isolation that we do, and it is uh, by design. So that's, that's an important point. We do not do multi-tenant consolidation at the HVX level. You want to dive into a little bit of cloud fitting? I think that but might cloud be. fitting, yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. So. You did do that, though. Could you decrease your costs and actually be cheaper than AWS? Uh, <laughs> very good, very good question. Uh, it is also something that we are, uh, you know, we have explored, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. But okay. uh, but it, definitely an interesting question, especially actually, especially if you look at AWS pricing, you see that there is uh, uh, there's linearity in terms of uh, pricing on memory, basically. So if you have a four gig machine, it's going to cost you half of what an eight gig machine would cost you. 
essentially. There are some very interesting instances where the linearity is broken in a, in a good way. And I think there, there's a lot of creativity that one can, mm -hmm. uh, can use. And I think there are other cloud providers that are also coming up with, uh, you know, very beefy from a memory perspective instance. And there we think there's a, a lot of uh, a lot of interesting things, but uh, yeah, also because of uh, fragmentation, because you can yes, basically exactly. <laughs> better use yes. instances. That's yeah. correct. Would, could you envisage that as an option in the future that we, if I know what I'm doing, that I, I co-host my boat applications? It's a very good question. It, it actually changes a little bit of the philosophy of what we do because our current assumption is that actually, if you saw the the demo and all of that. You didn't see HVX anywhere. No, no. You didn't see the networking anywhere. And that was by design. We wanted to make it easy for enterprises to be able to consume and just upload their VMs, throw it on the canvas, and run it. And that's it. That was, that was what we did in the, in the first phase. Later, there, there are things that we're considering where we can actually expose the HVX infrastructure, especially to uh, people that are familiar with virtualization, where you have you click an option, and now you see a lot more you know, advanced, like the advanced tab, if you will, where you can see a lot of sort of host infrastructure, uh, get into a lot more fine-grained networking control. In fact, you will see the first instantiation of that finer grain control more in networking than you will in virtualization settings. Yeah. That is a little while ago, a little while away. And we'll talk a bit more about that in the, the next session. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't need to see the HVX. In fact, that table that you drew there uh, would be enough if you could say, I want optimal network performance, or I could live with lower network performance. That would be an option that I okay, could Okay, so it's like, like more like a, it's basically you want, you want some control on locality, is what you're locality, saying, right? Yeah. That's the... And my price would go yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. Good, but, yeah. And by the way, it makes sense also in terms of high availability. If you want to tell us, do not schedule these two into the same... Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Go for the cheap stuff, yeah. and I, I know mm -hmm. the risk I'm running. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. 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 Makes sense. No, it's true. So there are definitely interesting things that we can do in that direction. Yeah. yeah. So, in terms of our cloud feeding algorithm, I guess the best way to think of it is, is an online um, resource scheduler, which basically takes a bunch of constraints, which part of those are the aggregate number of, uh, of CPUs and, and, and memory um, performance constraints, such as should you use SSD disks from the cloud providers or usual disks, uh, all kinds of constraints that are actually coming from the cloud providers, like the maximal volume size or the minimal volume size and uh, locality constraints. Uh, and basically, we feed it into this, this algorithm, which eventually spits out the cheapest configuration that can actually uh, make sure that all these constraints are satisfied. Uh, so that's a cloud feeding algorithm, which we keep on working on because a better feeding there is actually lower prices for our users as well as better uh, for us. Um, so that's one of. You get that cost before deploying, or you yeah. get it after? Yeah, you get it before deploying, and if you explore different options such as different regions, different cloud providers, you see the updated cost. Also, any, any change that you do, if you remove a VM, you add a few VMs, you upsize, you downsize the VM, you will see the cost impact immediately. We try to be as transparent as we can, and that's after deployment. If you before, if, if you so, what if you resize a? Can you can you resize a virtual machine after a deployment? Yeah, you can. So f first of all, the deployment that you saw there is completely dynamic. You can add VMs, you can remove VMs. For resizing a VM right now, you will need to stop it. We do not support uh, hot plugs, basically. Uh, so you need to stop it. You can down, downsize or upsize. And then maybe because you're deploying a new HVX someplace else and putting them on top of it. Exactly. Them. That, or it might even be on the same thing. one. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when you make that change to the virtual machine, you have to hit an update button, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's when we'll actually implement those changes. But before you hit update, <clears throat> we'll tell you that it's, it's going to cost you this much. So earlier, your application cost you a dollar and eight cents. Now it's going to cost you a dollar and 15 cents. Mm -hmm. This is an example. Right. Okay.